Pay attention. Today we're talking about Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. In this book, Freire writes about revolutionary education practices and their role in, well, dance, dance. He goes into great detail about his methodology, the revolutionary theory behind it, and examples of the pedagogy in practice. So what is the pedagogy of the oppressed? Well, first we need to talk about the pedagogy of the oppressor, which is the standard model taught in pretty much every school in the United States and all over the world. Freire calls this the banking method of education. In the banking method, education is organized as a hierarchy. The primary assumption is that the teacher possesses knowledge and the students do not. Knowledge flows in one direction, from the teacher to the students. In this method, the teacher is a subject, as in a person with subjective life experience and agency, and the students are treated as mere objects. This pedagogy replicates other systems of oppression in society and entrains the students to accept these oppressive systems as the default when they encounter them in the world at large. This is the effect that Freire's pedagogy attempts to subvert. In the pedagogy of the oppressed, the primary assumption is reversed. Both teacher and students are presumed to have knowledge, and each person can learn from any other. The teacher, or in Freire's words, teacher-student, poses a problem to the students' teachers and invites them to reflect on it and share their thoughts. This creates an environment of inner subjectivity where each person is valued by and valuable to the process, and as a result, the participants are empowered to see themselves as human beings, each of whom has the capacity to transform the world through their knowledge and action. Okay, so what is the difference between the systems? I'd say that one is all about doing for, the other is all about doing with. In the banking method, the teacher embodies authority. They have all of the knowledge, all of the power. They do all of the thinking for their students. In Freire's method, the teacher and students have authority together. They assume the students have knowledge and by inviting open discussion, validate that knowledge. It's a process that's inherently dialogic, not monologic. In terms of power dynamics, traditional pedagogy is imbalanced. It will always produce well-intentioned teachers who inadvertently impose their values on students and students who believe they must always search outside themselves for truth. And that's the best case scenario. At worst, this kind of education can be a platform for the abuse of power, spreading of lies, and outright subjugation of vulnerable human beings. If you're a leader or an educator, you need to ask yourself if you're imposing your values on the people who look up to you. In those kinds of situations, we tend to think that we're doing what's best for people, but how can you know if what you're doing is helping unless you work with people, not just for them? As Freire says, the means used are not important. To alienate human beings from their own decision-making is to change them into objects. So I think it's more than fair to say that Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed creates a much more egalitarian environment than traditional pedagogy. In fact, it's revolutionary by pretty much any standard. And that's because it's based on the concept of intersubjectivity. Okay, bro, that's enough. You think you can keep tossing around words like intersubjectivity without giving context to help the audience understand? First off, dude's okay, bro is not. Second, I know the people watching this are smart. I don't want to insult their intelligence. Isn't it boring to just listen to me explain a million different things? Doesn't matter, dude. Communication is all about clarity and message. Let me help you out with a little thing I call a framing device. Intersubjectivity is a philosophy which denies the commonly held worldview that people are either subjects, those with agency, or objects, those without. This is the viewpoint of the oppressor, whose aim is to manipulate the masses to their own benefit. Intersubjectivity shines a light on a truth that is easy to understand but difficult to live, that each person is a subject and has agency, and that no person is an object. Unlike the subject-object dialectic, an intersubjective experience cannot be broken down into yes-no, right-wrong binaries. Instead, it is up to each individual to respect others' freedoms and selfhood through equitable dialogue. To paternalistically impose knowledge or a way of being on someone, or to do their work for them, is to rob them of their humanity. Connecting with other human beings as equals in a society that revolves around inequality is incredibly hard, but absolutely necessary. The world we want depends on it. That was pretty good. 
Okay, so I imagine most of you are on board by now, but I know there's at least a few of you out there who are thinking something like, oh, well, sometimes people really don't know what's best for them. After generations of successful propaganda campaigns, people are so entrenched in the dominant ideology, there's no hope of producing class consciousness in them through dialogue. We don't have time. We have to take on some authoritarian strategies as a means to an end in order to create a just society. And once we do, we can implement the intersubjective relations suggested by the pedagogy of the oppressed. First, very powerful, love your spirit. Second, you're wrong, and here's why. When would-be revolutionaries utilize the means of the oppressor to take power, they change the contents of the message without changing the container. What is the container? The hierarchical, oppressive tools of communication like the banking method that teach people that they are neither respected nor trusted by the messenger. You can't tell people what to think without at the same time telling them that you don't trust them to think for themselves. So even if you do come to power, it won't really matter. You won't have created a revolutionary society because you don't have the trust of the people. There will always, always be that division that you created with your refusal to work with the people at the outset. I didn't always feel this way, but more and more I see that the means are the end. And in order to create a just society, you must embody justice with everything you do. The revolution can only come about with the people, never for them. It is only possible through community, trust, and love. And on that subject, Ferry speaks very clearly. Dialogue cannot exist, however, in the absence of a profound love for the world and for people. The naming of the world, which is an act of creation and recreation, is not possible if it is not infused with love. Love is at the same time the foundation of dialogue and dialogue itself. It is thus necessarily the task of responsible subjects and cannot exist in a relation of domination. Domination reveals the pathology of love, sadism in the dominator, and masochism in the dominated. Because love is an act of courage, not of fear, love is commitment to others. No matter where the oppressed are found, the act of love is commitment to their cause, the cause of liberation. And this commitment, because it is loving, is dialogical. As an act of bravery, love cannot be sentimental. As an act of freedom, it must not serve as a pretext of manipulation. It must generate other acts of freedom, otherwise, it is not love. Only by abolishing the situation of oppression is it possible to restore the love which that situation made impossible. If I do not love the world, if I do not love life, if I do not love people, I cannot enter into dialogue. Makes sense, right? That's it for now, and normally I'd leave you with whatever book I'm reading, but in the spirit of the pedagogy of the press, I want to pose a problem. How do you transform the world with the people in your life? Read a book, you nerds. Thank you.